Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again. It's another monthly lecture, but this time something with a difference. Uh, my job in doing this spin gets uh, more challenging every month. But um, I think it's for a good cause, driven by people who are determined and passionate to do more. And what I do find is that as a result, I'm talking about more things before the actual lecture. But today we want to cover a few things which we know are going to be very interesting and uh, useful for people to know in addition to the talk's content. So uh, let me run through a couple of areas. Firstly, we'll start off by standing, uh, thanking Nations Trust Bank, right? So they've been our partners, as you know, the lectures, publications. Uh, we recently had a fantastic media workshop. And so they've been you know, very, very engaged in taking that critical conservation message to all parts of uh, the world. And so thanks to them very much. They support us on our publications, Loris, Varna, Varnam, and I know a couple of them are in the audience today, and I'm going to be uh, calling them out by name uh, later on. So thank you so much for all that uh, passion and commitment team. And um, so I hope all of you are getting your magazines. Oops, uh, somebody had better put the slides up. Yeah, that's good. I'm not that good looking, so. Right, um, so um, in addition, I hope all of you are getting your magazines. It's very easy, click, it's online. We've shifted to the digital world and uh, we'd like you to kind of embrace that and it's more environment friendly as well. So enjoy. There's something for everyone. <clears throat> Once upon a time, you know, we were concerned that the average age in the WNPS was a big problem. Uh, I can tell you for sure that we are no longer as worried. Uh, over the last few years, there's been a massive buildup of a very strong, vibrant youth wing. And uh, we want to thank uh, NDB Bank. So they've really been uh, very much our partner on that journey, right? The youth wing. You know, it's a great chance for young people to learn, you know, about all the treasured fauna, flora, and connect with young kids, similar ages, similar thinking. So if you have young kids and their friends, send them our way. Uh, today, they are partnering with over 120 schools. We were doing a review in our meeting yesterday, and among other things, uh, our young president said he's already got some 50 odd people in the Northern Club alone. And so we are building a very, very vibrant uh, youth movement. It's a lot of work going on, very, very proud because that group alone is probably doing more than all the work we did in WNPS a few years ago. So, you know, it's come a long way. And uh, please join them, send your youngsters, encourage them. And uh, I know they were in Badrelia and Batiklo the recent weeks, and I saw some lovely pictures of uh, murals and things. I think you'll see them in our coming publications and things like that. So a lot of great stuff. and some interesting field trips and other stuff coming up with the youth wing so i would say you know get engaged hit the field understand what's happening all over the country this is nothing to do with colombo base in fact we find that we are doing less work in colombo with the youth wing now which is what we always wanted um shifting to something maybe you know some people would really relate to that's a multi-regional monitoring uh, you know, it's, it's a program where we are really focusing on the conservation of Sri Lankan leopard and uh, WNPS partners LOLC to establish this multi-regional monitoring system for the conservation of Sri Lankan leopard. So we've set up research, uh, research centers in these locations, different parts of the country, six if I'm not mistaken, and uh, in addition to studying behavior and, you know, all kinds of things, they will also work very closely with the communities and you know we have a huge challenge with all the leopard deaths due to snares so there's a big role to play in community engagement so you find that the team is spending quite a bit of time in the hills these days and so so we, we are not uh, we are not feeling flustered we understand that there is conflict but we also know that this is solvable manageable with the right intervention so thanks to elwell so this is a fairly big project multi-year project but we are very excited and we've already hired the teams and set up all those locations. So interesting stuff. Um, if you thought, you know, we are about uh, getting older, it's all about getting younger. 
couple of years ago, very recently actually, two, three years ago, we began the Wild Kids program and everybody laughs when they hear that name. But essentially we are picking up kids from the ages of four to 12 and that's supported strongly by uh, Ceylon Bank. And uh, we've been you know, very encouraged with the number of kids who've been showing up firstly for our online programs and now for the stuff that we do physically. So uh, it started during the pandemic with the lockdowns, but now you're seeing all the kids coming for our walks and you know uh, experiences. Kids love butterflies, by the way, and we are lucky to have Rajika. Uh, so very soon we are having an excursion where you know kids are going to be put uh, into the butterfly habitats a couple of days away. So if you have young kids in that age group, please, dear parents, find a bit of time. What we were talking about yesterday was we do realize that it's the kids, that's us, of the parents who took them out for, you know, park safaris and wilderness exposures who are at the forefront of the battle now for conservation. So don't forget to expose your kids. It's not all about a screen, right? Yep, that's our future, walking in as we speak, right? Um, couple of years, 2020 is when we began plant, WNPS plant. So we realized that, you know, you can't just let the future of conservation be totally reliant on the state. And we've seen, you know, how wonderfully the state has let us down on many areas in this country. So what can we do? This is our way of fighting back and bringing private conservation to the fore. What do we mean by private conservation, looking at land, either owned directly by us or through our partners. And we are raising funds and encouraging partners and setting aside land blocks as private conservation spaces. So the bigger picture here is to see how we can connect these forest corridors. 90% of our endemics are in the southwest of the country, which is where we have the least amount of forest cover. And we are trying to create small forest corridors, patches, and giving the endemics a better chance at surviving. So this is, uh, we've made some very exciting progress and you know, uh, it's wonderful to see all these partners and more, some international partners who have funded us. And right now we have uh, 300 odd acres of land under our purview. And uh, we, we think that by the end of this year, with some of the partners that we are aligning with, that we'll probably have over a thousand acres as a conservation footprint uh, where land is being set aside for conservation. So you're seeing some interesting species, whether it's pangolins or forest eagle owls or different endemics. And I'm hopeful maybe next month when we meet, I'll hopefully be able to show you some of the tuskers and the leopards who are also our custodians. So we are very proud of that work and uh, encouraging everyone to join us. That beautiful waterfall is at the corner of one of the lands that we, WNPS owns. Minuangella, right? So we've been buying land in our own right, as well as fighting to get private land set aside for conservation. Just on the left of that, sadly, is a land that a private party bought at the same time, which was forest. So, you know, side by side, land is getting lost. We are fighting to conserve. Come join the battle. Right. And that's raw. So that's our, you know, first uh, foray in um, land restoration, about seven years of hard work. But I know that initiative began, you know, many years back with previous committees, and it has a longer history as well. So a lot of, uh, you know, milestones and steps. That's where it was when we cleared it up. This is where it is today. And uh, I'll give you the bad news, which is also exciting that we started discovering our first snares in this property now, right? So we have, we've started doing some scientific analysis and we're seeing a lot of species come back because now the foliage is about 12 to 15 feet in height. Nice forest cover coming up. Uh, that means uh, human predators also eyeing the species who come back. But the good news for us is it's, you know, all these are encouraging signs that the forest is kicking back. And it's been a massive effort. Ajita de Costa has been uh, very instrumental in helping us coupled with a couple of early partners. Not a pretty sight. We're going to be talking a lot about it, but uh, you know, the human elephant conflict, I, I won't talk too much today because you know that's what we're going to spend more time on. 
but you know that within that we started the LRS project and you'll hear more about that stuff today but uh, you know it's an interesting solution and uh, today we have it uh, Jehan says the latest count is 21 locations all over the country did you know that WNPS has 21 pilots running on human elephant conflict uh, a solution in that manner so there is a lot happening that you know uh, not too many people know so we've been um, hopeful that these solutions different ways of thinking can contribute to mitigating that multi-million rupee sponsorships both from Colombo jewelry stores and sparsi lawn towards that initiative and you know we'll be hopefully releasing a scientific paper very soon of, of all these little low-cost gadgets translate into saving lives and money both for people and elephants so i'm sure you're looking forward to the talk and you know you can compare and contrast the work we do um marine is other big initiative some of the most ambitious projects that we are planning are in the marine area and uh, there's a silent but vital green revolution taking place where we are trying to give life back to a massive mangrove footprint in the Ani Vilundava in the Ramsar Sanctuary there in Putlam. Multiple partners, DWC is at the forefront of that, you know, University of Wyamba and us creating a consortium and doing a lot of work and different partners uh, coming in to pick up land blocks. Fascinating and high tech stuff. So look forward and watch that project, but people who love marine areas, they're doing a lot, not just in Ani Vilundava, but uh, the you know the beaches and inland waters and so many things so our ambitions are bigger than our capacity we'd like more people to join us to kind of continue that work if more people join we can double treble the amount of work we're doing even though we've been growing at a huge rate on the fun side you know the next uh, trip is to Bundala. i know many of you love getting out in our different excursions so uh, please sign up a couple of days away and uh, always we have the best of uh, resource people on those trips and you know not too many people come back uh, dissatisfied with what they see and experience it's great fellowship like-minded people and always you learn a lot from you know the people in the room don't forget to patronize this is some pictures from you know yala we refurbished that bungalow lovely beach lovely experience and if you're lucky our resident elephant might pay a visit it's been known to haunt that area quite regularly now so we find ways to contribute by also you know occupying our bungalows here and there um, thanking and not forgetting sarva who does lots of our creatives and this is one of their more recent initiatives so they're trying to see if we can work on a interesting idea of desktop uh, calendars but with a conservation theme right so sarva has been very critical in terms of our journey bring a lot of creatives to the table because as you know in this digital world it's all about storytelling right finally i want your money and that's this one right the star points a lot of you have star points that you're accumulating which you don't even realize with dialogue right and they uh, you know literally die at the end of the month at the end of the year i believe so please just check out your star point balances and channel them my way you can give up some of your shopping habits and instead put that money to good use just a click away and you can donate those points for conservation to last much longer than that bag or pair of shoes that you pick up with the star points so you know help us make a difference we need money and uh, as you can see i hope you realize from the kind of uh, few things this is not some of our work but it's part of our work right but if this is you know maybe 50 60 percent of the work we do you can imagine the funding that is coming in now to do this. It's no mean feat when we are picking up land blocks and restoring projects and uh, hiring people and all of that. So we are really blessed to have these kind of partners. Many of them, you know, uh, in the lead is Sampath Bank, who have been our partner for over two decades and consistently with us. And many of these partners, once they come on board, have really been partners almost for life committing themselves to a Sri Lankan conservation. So thank you so much to Nations Trust Bank, uh, LOLC, NDB Bank, DLF Serums, Sampath Bank, like I said, Mercantile Investments, Mr. Ajita Di Costa, JK Office Automation, Spasilon, Colombo Jewelry Stores, Abans, LG, Kumarika, 
Emas Consumer Brands, Delhi's Advantage, Lanka Environmental Fund, Dilma, Ceylon Bank, Sanjay Lanka, and uh, with some of the recent work we've been doing, we have a number of global partners who've been funding us, and they've been funding us in, you know, double-digit millions for some of our initiatives, like the Rainforest Trust, the U.S. Forest Services, Resolve with their Quick Response Fund. So thank you, one and all. It's your participation which helps us to dream bigger, but it's also your engagement which is finally going to make the difference. So please join us. Don't be a passive consumer of wildlife and conservation. Be an active contributor towards conservation. That's our final ask. And uh, with that, let me hand over to Jehan, who's uh, been spearheading the HEC for many years, and no one better than Jehan to kind of be a uh, introducer to Tempe. Jehan Tempe, do you mind? Good evening, people. Thank you for coming today. So my role here is to introduce Tempe, Dr. Tempe Adams uh, from Botswana, uh, but who works for Elephant Without Borders. Uh, but she is originally from Australia, Sydney. So Tempe um, is currently a co-existence and education manager for Elephant Without Borders. Uh, NGO dedicated to the protection and conservation of Africa's elephants through a variety of innovative research and educational studies and information sharing with the people. Uh, she works very, very closely with farmer communities and um, in our discussions and me meetings that we have had in the last few, last two, three days, uh, she has told us that in some instances, there are farmer communities that call and ask if I have to come and see us this week. So that tells you how much she is relating to them. Uh, Tempe's role in the organization is working with communities in helping them live and farm within wildlife areas and conflict free. Uh, she's currently based in the Chobe district uh, of Northern Botswana, an area known for its high elephants population. Uh, from the understanding we have, one third of the savannah elephants of Africa live in Botswana. So about 20, 125 to 130,000, no, sorry, is that right? <laughs> yeah, 130,000 elephants and about 25,000 to 30,000 in Botswana itself. Um, Tempe has published a number of scientific publications uh, providing all working towards combating human elephant conflict. In fact, how we got to know about her was when Dave was doing some research to see who else is doing a light triple system to mitigate uh, human elephant conflict. We came across her name and our journey has been about three years that we connected with her and been discussing and then COVID hit so we couldn't, we couldn't do this earlier, but she's here now. So her research has been featured in the BBC and, and the Times and CNN and National Geographic to name a few. Uh, so I'm very honored to have Dr. Tempe Adams in Sri Lanka delivering our lecture. And uh, Tempe, all for you. Thank you. Oh my, what an introduction. <laughs> I feel like it's all being covered now. <laughs> um, firstly, I wanted to say hello and a huge thank you to everyone here that's attending and, and making the effort to come and listen. I want to say a very, very heartfelt thank you to the society for inviting me uh, to come along. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here. This is my first time to Sri Lanka. I'm embarrassed to say that actually. Um, it has been at the top of my to go to list for a very many number of years, but honestly, I thought if I came, I might not leave. So that might still happen. <laughs> And I wanted to say a very sincere thank you for the sponsors that allowed me to be here today as well. Um, very, very, very much appreciate it. Happens to me my favorite tea, um, Dilma. That's not a plug, that's a genuine, <laughs> genuine statement. Um, but yes, obviously uh, I work and live in Botswana. I've been there for 10 years now working on conflict coexistence. Obviously I'm not from Botswana, I'm from Australia, but yeah, I'm very much uh, becoming 
and I'm very, very heavily involved in Botswana now, now referred to as a citizen, not officially though. So yeah, so uh, this presentation is talking about how we can coexist with elephants. Obviously, it's one of the most topical issues in this country and equally so in Botswana. So hopefully I can um, tell some good stories, talk about some good science, and we can have a nice discussion from it. So let's talk about what conservation has looked like in Africa. So historically, um, actually they say in the 1920s and 30s, although we don't have the best records, there was over, well over one to two to maybe potentially three million elephants on the whole continent. So you can see up on the map there, that's the historical range. That's the area I'm talking about. So it's a pretty phenomenal area that elephants were ranging throughout the continent. Obviously, we have two different uh, species. We've got the savanna and the forest elephants there. Um, the forest elephants are currently listed as critically endangered and savanna elephants are listed as endangered. But that is actually under debate literally right now at COP, at CITES. Um, and then as through the years, very sadly, you can see our map uh, to the right, um, it shows a huge diminish in the range for elephants and their populations. It's been absolutely devastating. Sec and it's mainly happened in the last 30 to 40 years. So now we've got an estimated number of 415,000 left on the whole continent, and that's pretty startling. So it, it estimated 68% loss in the last 30 years. So it's largely due to similar factors as here is uh, increased development, um, land, land fragmentation, uh, ivory poaching is still very, very, very much alive and strong throughout the elephant range um, and increase in human population. So it comes down to space. When we have a little snapshot look at Southern Africa, uh, so this area highlighted here is a, a little part of Southern Africa. So obviously Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. That is an area that has the highest concentration that we have left on the continent. Those are the population numbers from a 2018 aerial survey. And as you can see, Angola has a few. Uh, Botswana has 130,000 approximately. Uh, Namibia, Zambia, and, and Zimbabwe does have quite a strong hold. But you can clearly see Botswana uh, really, really does have a substantial number of the elephants that we have left there, uh, you know, basically one third of the amount of elephants left on the continent. So this just puts a little scale to that. So our pie chart there is the actual range, potential elephant range that Botswana can hold compared to the rest of the continent. So this is habitat that they can actually exist in. So obviously quite a small portion of that. And then our pie chart to the right actually shows you the proportion that Botswana is responsible for. Um, so it's, it's pretty substantial. So just a little bit of a background about the Botswana elephant population. So obviously, as we've said, it's the largest. That's our estimate. We actually have just flown aerial surveys in the country. It was fit, they finished flying surveys about two weeks ago. So we're very, very, very hotly anticipating those numbers. Um, but it's occupying within Botswana a range largely in the north, which is approximately 115,000 square kilometers. So that's around 1.35 per square kilometer. However, the range is actually shifting. We're seeing more and more of a push further south um, and not so much up in northern areas. Um, so currently, 70% uh, of the current elephant range actually falls outside of the national parks and reserves. I know it's a very high proportion here as well. So the population, fascinatingly, the population was on the brink of collapse in the early 19th century. This is largely uh, due to hunting <laughs> that was occurring. Um, and then in the 1990s, we had drafted our first ever elephant management plan, and we estimated that there was around 55,000 elephants at that time. What is very interesting and unique about Botswana is the large proportion of the population. Um, so obviously it's quite a small population. It's estimated 2.3 million, which is relative to, relative to here, very small. Um, but 65% of that population is largely located in the southern regions of the country, which is actually outside of the elephant range. But the population is growing. Um, we are trying to get more up to date stats but the they they're estimating that in the last 28 years it's increased by 
by, uh, sorry, in the last 10 years, it's increased by 28%. Um, so we, we are rapidly growing actually. Um, and it's been pretty much historically, it's been a hands-off sort of management strategy for elephants. By that, I mean, there's never, we've never had culling in the country, uh, which our neighbors in Zimbabwe have done. Many, many other Southern African countries have had culling programs. That's never been the case in Botswana. It's been very, very much mitigation focused and compensation focused. However, we have got increasing conflict. Um, this is basically the populations that we do have in the north of the country inside the elephant range live and need water. It's a very, very dry country. We have Kalahari Desert Savannah. So water is key. So everyone is competing for the water, the wildlife, the people, everyone needs water. So that's actually where our conflict sort of lies. We've had many, many drafted elephant management plans. Another one was drafted last year. However, we've never put any in place and actually implemented them. So what is also really unique about Botswana, it was something we were talking about in our workshop earlier today at the society actually, was Botswana's elephant population is not just Botswana's elephant population. So this map is actually data from Elephants Without Borders, our NGO, and each of those little dark points is a movement position, a GPS location of an elephant that's moving in that region. So Botswana's elephants, basically what we're trying to represent there is, are not just Botswana's elephants, they're also Zimbabwe's elephants and Zambia's elephants and Namibia's elephants and Angola's elephants. So hugely, hugely significant. It's a continuously moving population. And I think our management has to incorporate that. It's something to be very mindful of. But obviously Botswana seems to still have the bulk of all those animals, even though they have great habitat in those surrounding countries. So why is that? Basically, uh, the Botswana government allocated a huge amount of land for protection for wildlife protected areas, which is pretty, pretty phenomenal uh, on their side of things. Also, as I said, we have a low population, but it's growing. And until quite recently, we've had very strong anti poaching policies. The sole purpose of the military in Botswana is anti poaching. Um, so that's, that sends quite a message. And for a very long time, we had a shoot to kill policy, as in if a poacher was seen uh, poaching anywhere in Botswana, the army didn't have to ask questions, they could shoot. So it had very, very strong policies. There were controversial policies, but it did seem to keep poaching quite low. So I work for a Botswana based wildlife NGO called Elephants Without Borders. And we are despite we're, we've been, we were registered in 2004, which is actually one of the longest running oldest NGOs in Botswana. <laughs> And we were started by a Botswana, so a citizen of Botswana, a, a man called Dr. Mike Chase. And he was the first citizen to do his PhD on elephant biology in the country. He then, with his partner Kelly Landon, set up the NGO based on the findings of his PhD. And the whole premise of Elephants Without Borders is exactly that. He really learned and really discovered the, tra the level and the amount, the, the size of the home range of what these Botswana elephants are doing within this region. He was the first to kind of really start to do consecutive aerial surveys to understand population and how it's changing in the area as well. Hence, so we came up with the name of Elephants Without Borders. So our whole mandate is obviously elephants don't use passports. So we need to be mindful of that. We've got to focus on a biodiversity level of management. Um, we, their big mandate for many, many years was just maintaining transboundary movements to allow the elephants to move out of Botswana, to allow them to move into the neighboring countries. That was the big focus for many years. It still is a large amount of the focus of our NGO. However, they did keep saying that seeing the fact that conflict was increasing and starting to place some more focus on that. And that's where I came into the picture. So let's look at different perspectives that we have on elephants. These same perspectives exist here, I think. We have a very romanticized, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, appreciative perspective of elephants, right? From a tourism perspective, they bring us lots of tourists to come in. They're beautiful to photograph. They're beautiful to witness. It's incredible. I don't think there's anything better in the world that them being able to sit there and watch a wild elephant herd interact in the wild, in their natural habitat with their family. I think it's truly, truly extraordinary and an honor to be able to witness. They're obviously one of the most uh, popular animals to put, make documentaries on as well. 
there's a very big global love for elephants, right? But this is the other perspectives that often can be forgotten and people on the ground experience. Elephants are difficult to live with. They are a literally big problem. <laughs> so these are, these are photos all taken uh, within 100 kilometers of my house. Um, so we have common conflict, we have urban conflict. So elephants in townships, uh, you can see we have potential road accidents going on there. We have crop raiding of elephants. So that's a torch shining on cheeky elephants coming in and eating a crop. Uh, we have elephants that are stepping over our veterinarian fences that are trying to control foot and mouth. And they, well, he looks quite crafty in how he's getting over that, but some of them do knock them straight down. Um, and then we still have poaching. So we still have ivory poaching, as, uh, as some of you might know, obviously both uh, males and female elephants uh, have tusks um, of the savannah species. So we're actually based in the far north of the country in, the, in an area called the Chobe District. Uh, the Chobe District is debatably sort of elephant mecca on the continent. We have one of the highest densities of elephants in, in the world. Um, and it's an area largely made up again of, of wildlife protected areas. We have the very famous Chobe National Park, as you see highlighted there in green. And we're located right on the border, as you can see, of Zimbabwe, Zambia and Namibia. So we are quite, a, quite an interesting uh, area for sure. And we're based, our NGO is based in a tiny town. It's not that clear on the map there, but it's in the far, far corner and it's a town called Kasani. So why is conflict important in Chobe? Um, so Chobe district actually has more elephants than people. <laughs> um, it again, but having said that, the human population is is dramatically increasing. Um, they're saying even in the time I've been living there, so 10 years, it's tripled in size. So we're seeing rapid urban expansion. It's a uh, it's special because it actually has Chobe National Park, but it actually also has all the allocated forest reserves in the country just in that one district. So it's very, very much wildlife protective focused. However, there is farming occurring. Uh, it's highlighted in the series of villages there on the left, Ketchikau, Kavimba, Mobeli, Machenchi. These are all small subsistence farmings, and this is also debatably one of the biggest conflict hotspots in the country. These are also some of the poorest people in the country. So conflict is primarily occurring because of sharing the space and the reduction of that, uh, increased development, which is occurring, and it is about conflict over resources, primarily water and access to water, as it is a largely very dry place. So this is just looking at, this is a review of the actual government uh, PAC data. So PAC is problem animal control. It's the uh, it's the uh, avenue of government that goes to the call outs when someone has an issue with an elephant. They call up the PAC, and this is this is the basically documentation of those call outs in the country. Um, unfortunately, I haven't gotten any more re recent data from them yet. It is notoriously difficult <laughs> to get data from them. Um, however, it lets you be able to see trends through time, which is quite fascinating. As you can see, uh, elephants and lion are our two biggest conflict, most reported, not too surprising, I think. Um, interestingly, we see a big spike in 2016, and then we come back down. Um, what is fascinating here is both of those species, uh, compensation is paid out. Um, let me just come back there. Uh, and Interestingly, on top of that was compensation was increased to 100% paid in 2013. So of course, the amount of calls coming in increased because people were literally getting paid more money to report. <laughs> so that's interesting. I think that's quite reflected in the statistics, quite honestly. So this is just another kind of summary of what we look at. Um, so that's just specifically looking at Kasani. So Kasani being an urban center, not an agricultural center, that's a town. We still have a lot of urban conflict, not just agricultural conflict, which is unlike a lot of African countries. African countries generally, the urban centers are so thick and dense, wildlife don't come near. However, in Kasani and, and in Botswana, we, we still do have a lot of wild elephants right in town, not just elephants, but a whole array of animals you'll see a bit later. Um, and then you can kind of break down on, in what's kind of causing and creating these PAC reports. So obviously 60% of it is predator related, so livestock being killed. That's lions, leopards uh, and hyena, and sometimes wild dog. 
um, killing, killing the livestock. And then crop and garden damage is 29%. So you can see a substantial amount. So property damage, they're not differentiating what species, but usually more often than not, it is elephants that are causing the property damage. And personal threat is there with 1%. We actually have a very, very, given the number of elephants, very low number of people actually killed by elephants, which is something I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to report. But interestingly, it's very, very difficult to get numbers of number of elephants killed never gets spoken about whenever I ask no one can give me any numbers I personally know of a many number of elephants that have been injured from farmers but to actually get numbers and statistics associated with that it is exceptionally difficult so this is just give you an idea of, of the, where the money is going um, I was chatting actually um, to the department yesterday and we were chatting about compensation and our as it works any farmer that calls in uh, and reports elephant damage or wildlife damage. Uh, a member of the Department of Wildlife has to go to that assessment, do an assessment, measure the amount of damage, and then they get paid based on the amount of damage. What, what is meant to be the value of the crop? It's not necessarily at all the case. There's obviously huge issues, issues in that. Often the Department of Wildlife people don't answer their phones. Um, sometimes they don't have a vehicle. So there is a big delay in the system. But this is this has been the system for a many number of years in Botswana, a compensation based system. So I think what we all are starting to understand is conflict is very unique and it's always changing. Depending on the different area, the different time, it's always very dynamic and, and always robust and always keeping us on our toes. So as I said, we've got urban conflict and agricultural conflict. They require different tactics and solutions, very different mitigations to solve them. Understanding the different drivers of the conflict is absolutely key to coming up with the solutions. These things sound very obvious, but sadly they're very overlooked. So we have the conflict that we have in Chobi is over shared space. It's also blocking off corridors. Um, these are just examples. And then we sometimes will have revenge killings. So say an elephant uh, damaged someone's fence post, someone might retaliate and go and then kill the next elephant that they see. So that, that can happen. Um, and those drivers obviously change through time. I think what's really, really important is there's never just one solution. I feel like sadly, we all wanna look for the one solution and it's, there's never, it's very rarely the case. Um, and I think what is also really important, and we'll go on to talk about it, but mitigations must be tested and trialed before invested, and before investments are made. I've seen time and time and time again, I've even heard cases of it here where there's been a great new sexy mitigation that's come out in a neighboring country or even in another part of the country. Um, and you think, gosh, let's go and implement it. And it fails. Um, and I think that's, that's so tragic because I think we should know better than that, to be honest. Uh, and nothing is going to happen coexistence wise unless you have the farmers and the people on the front line of the wildlife involved. They've got to be the ones driving it. They've got to be the ones holding your hand along the whole way and you've got to be doing it together. Otherwise, it's never going to work and it's always going to fail. So at Elephants Without Borders, we have a sort of threefold approach. Um, so bear with me. So basically it's understanding the movement and elephant ecology of those elephants that put themselves into these conflict situations. That's both the urban elephants and the agricultural elephants. They're often referred to as the problem elephants. It's really important that you understand why they're moving, where they are, um, and understand the motivation behind them. Secondly, it's really important to create meaningful mitigation programs, strategies that are actually going to relieve the conflict and help those on the front lines. And obviously what's key, and I see what the society is incredibly good at doing, is community education. You can't do anything without knowledge and imparting that knowledge to the communities. Uh, the younger, the better, I think, in being involved in such a thing, because as we always say, information is key and it's powerful. So let's start with number one, the movement ecology of, wild, of the elephants. Um, so we have monitored uh, wildlife corridors, both large scale sort of urban corridors and small, I'm mean, sorry, large scale agricultural corridors and small scale urban corridors using two different methods. We use motion triggered camera traps. So I've run a number of different camera trap surveys uh, over the last 10 years. 
um, trying to work out exactly where elephants move through um, those areas, um, move through the move through the urban and agricultural areas. I think camera traps are great because they kind of give you the best form of evidence of exactly what's going on. And we also use GPS collared data. So it gives you real time understanding of where those elephants are going. And it's really interesting to look at that at different time scales. So here, this is an example of images that we've taken in our urban corridors. So what's great about an elephant is, you know, they're sort of the umbrella species, but they're the flagship for the other species. So when elephants use a corridor and a pathway, all these other animals do too. So there might be some new animals up there for you. Kudu, civets, cattle, <laughs> uh, buffalo, impala. We've got porcupines, zebras. We have lions using our urban corridors. Spotted hyena, genets, which are small cats, water bucks. So that's just to name a few, quite honestly. And it's there's no denying an image. Um, I think it often has the most power when it's uh, when we're presenting this to authorities and and communities. I think when we have presented some of these images in our community, people are quite shocked to know that all these animals are living right outside their front door, and they didn't even potentially know it. So it just shows how cryptic and and how they are adapting to us. For many number of years, I this is the urban. These are all the urban corridors I was monitoring in Kasani and Kazangula. Unfortunately, this is quite an aged um, aerial map. It's far more developed uh, now, but that's kind of the best I could do to give you a scale of how close these corridors sort of are to one another. So you can see, and there's an image in uh, the top left, or the bottom, sorry, left corner, and that's our narrowest urban corridor, and that's two and a half meters wide. Uh, and then our largest urban corridor is about 220 meters wide. That's on the right hand side. And we monitored the wildlife use of them for six years, which was, yeah, fascinating. Each of the different colors is the land use allocation within that urban area. So the blue is um, open space recreational areas. That's where people go on picnic and enjoy. Um, the green or sort of looks greeny yellow that's industrial allocated land so there's lots of industries in that in that allocated area and red is farming so it's actually the only commercial farms that we have in the townships. And with that we published a paper uh, we published a paper showing how large charismatic animals like elephants are actually using urban corridors, this was the first of its kind published actually in Africa it's something where. It is more common throughout Asian countries, but in Africa, people didn't really think that elephants would use such small corridors. With these camera traps, I was looking at how the different land uses were impacting on the way the elephants were using those corridors. So you can actually see seasonally, there's very different use, okay? But we had a lot more use in post-wet season. So post-wet season is just after the rains. It seems like all the elephants come in and use these urban corridors. Begs the question, well, why? Why would they be doing that? It's a very strange time. There's still lots of water around. And we actually found that elephants were coming in when we had the peak time of our flood um, of our river. So not when the rains are there, but actually when the river is most flooded. And that's when grasses are their tastiest. That's when a lot of trees are fruiting. Um, so there is an explanation behind it, but looking at it seasonally and the behaviors is really fascinating. That's the beauty of camera traps. You can also look at things at an, on an hourly basis. We were actually seeing um, and on an hourly basis, the time of day and the land designation and the season significantly impacted how the elephants were using the corridors. Um, I think what's also very fascinating there on the, on the very bottom um, chart, you can actually see elephants are using it throughout the day. So not just at nighttime. So elephants, which is, Quite incredible and that's the open space recreational area so people and elephants are actually using that space at the same time um, that actually led us to then you can see one of our wildlife corridor signs we actually put up a series of wildlife corridor signs throughout the town when i first started it took me two years to get the approval to put up that sign <laughs> unfortunately now there we've gotten somewhere and people are much more willing but it's amazing the impact of a sign. It sounds so silly, but this was an area, this is a spot where you can see the elephants behind. You can have hundreds of elephants crossing over the road to move through the corridor. It's also an area where there is a major road going through there. That was a hotspot area for car accidents. 
as soon as we put the sign up, the road accidents reduced. It was, it's very, as again, it's very simple. Um, there was a lot of anger towards it, but once people accepted it, it was amazing how the road accidents suddenly didn't stop, but they reduced. Because even if you're subconsciously not even thinking, you, you see that sign and instantly just start to look for elephants and wildlife around. It's a lovely little solution. So this is just a nice video to show you how busy that little corridor that has the photo of two and a half meters wide. This is showing how busy that corridor is for just one week in our dry season. Okay, hopefully it's going to work. You might have music. There we go. So just one week. Okay, there we go. Quite a busy spot, as you can see. <laughs> um, I think we were all stunned by actually how important they are. And I think it just really highlights what an impact that would have if that was closed. And where are those animals meant to be pushed through? So as I said, that's actually an industrial, that's a, an industrial area those wildlife are passing through to be down there. And as you can see, they're coming through, especially the elephants during the day. Uh, so we also monitored the agricultural wildlife corridors. So these are the corridors in the subsistence farming areas. So these, so these are the corridors that are much wider. Um, this is arguably a higher conflict area. Uh, we use the camera trap um, process as well. Um, and it's an area where elephants are moving from the forest reserve in Chobe National Park. And the only water is, you betcha, right in front of where all the farms are. So the elephants have to move through if they want to go and drink at the river. They have to go through the farming areas, but they do use very specific corridors. Again, this was the first time they'd ever been sort of looked at in a corridor capacity. Um, we just did a very basic study. and. Interestingly, it looks like elephants use the agricultural corridors at completely the opposite time to the urban elephants. Uh, and this, the big debate that farmers will always say is, well, elephants come in when we're growing crops, that's when they come in. And interestingly, the camera traps showed the complete opposite to that. So crops are harvested, so we plant crops in Botswana, October, November, and we harvest January sort of sometimes may but usually around april is when most people are meant to be harvesting april time and in april you can see we don't really have that many elephants using those wildlife corridors what they are doing is coming in june through to october which is our peak dry season so elephants having to come in for water the impact that a chart like this when it's explained to farmers is actually quite impactful because they can't deny the photos so it's 
I think this it's such a simple thing, but it, it is quite fascinating to actually see in a very simple f format like this. Um, and then this is just showing you three weeks, as I said, so agricultural corridors as higher conflict rates. Um, so you do predict less wildlife, but this is just showing you three weeks in one of the agricultural corridors. So you can see slightly different animals there. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, but still very, very important. Still heavily used, right? Actually, that was in wet season as well. So that's not actually at the busiest time at all. But very high wildlife diversity using those corridors and very important. And that is right in the middle of the farming area that, we, that I work in. So then I came to think, gosh, there seems to be a very clear difference between the way elephants are using urban corridors and agricultural corridors. So I ran a study and recently just published a paper showing exactly that, actually how elephants are adapting to our different la urban landscape, our different developmental landscapes differently. And they're actually using those corridors differently. And we, we don't always keep that in mind. Sometimes we just think, wildlife corridors, it's all going to be uni universal, but it's not. Elephants are actually really actively trying to avoid us, but they're trying to avoid us in different ways. Um, and I think there's a, these are hopefully quite nice, simple figures just showing elephants use of the 24 hour, so hourly use in agricultural corridors versus the urban corridors. So you can see the agricultural areas, their behavior is strongly nocturnal. As soon as it, as soon as it gets dark, the elephants will come through. And then you'll see a peak use in corridors uh, till about just before midnight. And then as soon as it hits that, they start to leave. However, in the urban environment, you can see they sort of waffle in and they, they enjoy themselves and they're there throughout the day. Um, this makes me believe that it's far more threatening for them in the urban, I mean, the agricultural landscape than that of the urban landscape. Um, this was, again, the first time anyone had really looked at things at this sort of in-depth scale and actually compared how we're impacting wildlife's use of corridors. So the next step is chatting to the people on the front line, right? So we understand the wildlife ecology. We have all this wonderful evidence that we can take to land use planning, which is what we do all the time. But the next step is actually having the narrative of the people that are living there. And especially in the Chobe area, it was an area that had had a huge amount of conflict funding thrown at it before I arrived. And actually during the time I was there, um, there was big funding from the World Bank and big funding from USAID and very sadly, nothing to show for it. So I think when I first started working in that area, I really wanted to know why, where did we go wrong? Who went wrong? <laughs> so it was just about having long, long conversations with farmers that were willing and asking them about what happened, asking them about what mitigations they've used in the past, um, why did things not work? Why did they think some things did work? I also asked farmers opinions and identifying different hotspots, different areas that elephants most commonly will be coming in. Um, and I think it's really important to talk about why things have failed. So that was all collected, all that information was collected before we even started developing a mitigation program. And then I did this on a larger scale. I, re I published a paper looking at, and it I couldn't believe it hadn't been done before, but no one had actually looked at a nation level and asked people of opinions and perceptions of elephants and elephant management in the country. Um, so I made a very, very simple questionnaire. You didn't put your name to it. 
um, people could just be as honest and it was voluntary so people could hopefully be as honest as possible and I just asked really basic questions like do you like seeing elephants um, and the top bar chart says the majority of people, I think it was something 90% of people came back and said yes they did which was I was surprised by that result and then asked why um, it was strongly tied to nat a national heritage is deep Botswana pride and association with this elephant population. The second was that people find them interesting and they love wildlife. That was followed by aesthetically. So people were saying that they belong there, so they should be there and that's why they like it. Um, tourism was further down. Um, and a few, a few number of respondents actually said, well, they were here first, so they have the right to the land. These were responses I was very surprised to be seeing, to be honest. When asked another quite simple question, who's responsible for the management of elephants? Unsurprisingly, 80% of respondents said government. Government's job. <laughs> uh, what I thought was hopeful was 30% of people said it's the community members themselves as well. It's a combined effort. Such a simple study, but actually gives very, very interesting information. The take home message I found from that study was <clears throat> quite a sad one in that I said the majority of people in the country live in the southern parts um, and they're not in the elephant area. So unfortunately, there seems to be a big disconnect between those that are creating the policies and those um, and they're the ones not living with elephants and the, they're telling the people that are living with elephants how, how to live with them, even though they themselves have never had any experience in doing so. So there was a disconnect between between that and the very simple way of kind of working that out is if asking anyone who's living with elephants if they know that there was an elephant management plan and most respondents said they had no idea whereas when you ask people outside of the elephant range if they knew about it they were like yeah of course we know there's an elephant management plan and i was like wow that's quite telling that's very fascinating there so I, I don't want to harp on it, but I think it's very, very important why mitigations have failed in the past. It's something that's often not spoken about because no one wants to talk about failure, but I think it's so important to talk about because it's the only way we can learn where we went wrong. Um, so from this is from the front line, from the farmers that were trialing these. These were the many reasons what they listed. They said things were not sustainable, which makes sense. Um, they said a lack of trialing beforehand, which also makes sense we know happens. Too expensive, obviously cost is very important, especially with your someone that lives off their yield. Um, they said there was a lack of farmer buy-in, so that was from the people that were actually running the projects. Uh, there was a lack of monitoring and um, constant support and planning. A lot of things were just set up and given to the individuals and then there was no follow-up. Um, and too user intensive. Uh, that just means the farmers just found them a little bit too much time in their day to, to go and set up. Uh, but very important feedback. This is an example of uh, the importance of trialing and mitigation beforehand. So there was a lovely big flurry uh, about, I would say, eight years ago. Uh, where everyone wanted to put beehive fences up. Elephant beehive fences were the new big mitigation solution that we should all be using. Um, it's a fantastic project. I do not want to demean the person that came up with it. Dr. Lucy King is an absolute hero of mine. It's a very, very successful program in Kenya. I know she's implemented it in a number of different countries, Tanzania, Mozambique. Um, it's a great agribusiness. It's a great story, but I do think it's something that's a great example that needs to desperately be trialed before it's implemented. So I did that. I conducted an experiment because um, the whole premise is the elephants are scared of the sound of bees and the association of being stung when they hear that sound of bees. So that's the base. It's great. And that's true, you know. Um, but we didn't know if Botswana elephants are scared of bees. So we conducted a playback experiment just replicating exactly what Lucy had played wild herds up in Kenya. I replicated it same sound as, as much as I possibly could to sleeping elephants. Okay. Um, we play, I play, I felt a bit mean, I'd wait for them to get fast asleep and be very relaxed and then I would play them these noises. So they'd either get bees or a white noise. Uh, and then I would record their reaction, I would video their reaction and then categorize those reactions. Unfortunately, we didn't get significant results. Botswana's elephants are not scared of bees. Therefore, putting up Botswana bee fences maybe won't work as a mitigation. 
Um, there was a very clear and easy w understanding of that is that we just don't have the bee culture. We don't have the farming culture. We don't, it's too dry to have a good healthy bee population. So some elephants knew, but not the majority of elephants. So that just stresses the importance because the government was ready to invest millions into this. Uh, and thankfully it was slightly redirected. So what did we do? So with all that information I've been collecting, we created something that is still constantly being created and worked upon and we're always changing it. I think that's the key. You've always got to change things as elephants adapt. And it's called the side-by-side -side coexistence program. And it's all about investing in people. And it's all about the relationships that we have with these people. Um, as Jihan said, I'm at a point now where the farmers will literally call me. I'm, I'm getting calls while I'm here and saying, why are you not out here? And I said, well, guys, you're not, you're not growing crops at the moment. And they say, oh, it doesn't matter. We just want to see how you're doing. That's important. Relationships are important. What we've uh, actually created is a consultation process. Um, and it's almost what we call conflict consultation. So myself and my team will go and have meetings with farmers that are interested and we literally stand in their field or their garden or the area they're trying to protect and we talk to them about what they're farming, we talk to them about what they've used in the past, what their opinions are about it. Often is the case they're very angry to start off with, we let them be angry. And then after all that anger's out, we actually have a really meaningful conversation and we have a conversation and then we come up with suggestions of what they could do. Uh, we do this on a very one-on-one -on -one basis. We realize we have to do it that way because there's a lot of internal politics in these villages. A lot of people don't like their neighbors. So to try and do it in a, at a community level is very challenging. And we've created what we call the Ellie Senses Toolkit. So it is each of our senses. It's targeting each of the elephant senses, I should say. So we have a hearing mitigation sights, smell and taste and touch. Um, so the hearing is different alarm systems. We're trying to go more solar. So we have solar and battery systems. We have touch, which is an electrified rope. We definitely don't say electric fence. We say it's an electrified rope and it's solar powered. Um, smell and taste, we make a wonderful elephant repellent cocktail that we mix. Uh, we spray that on crops or we spray it on trees to protect certain trees and sight is similar to what the society has going on we have solar flashing lights um oh and, and they're same same but different different kind of con a very same concept actually so that's our that's our toolkit um that we created and basically what we do is with the farmers um we do what we call this is the most key part to it i think is the assessment process um, so each farmer, as I said, we go to their field, um, we give, we have very long dialogues, it doesn't matter how long, and we give the farmers as much time as they want, but they have to fit a certain criteria to be part of our program, because once they're in our program, they're family. So they almost have to prove their worthiness to be a part of it, because we expect updates every single week, we expect feedback, we want to know what's been in or near their field we want to know exactly what's going on i never complain about getting too much information from the farmers i want too much information so we're quite specific we say no crops or fields larger than six hectares because then it becomes very ineffective these mitigations we're always trying to stretch the farmers to sm farm smart and small you can get a beautiful yield out of two hectares a very very healthy yield and it's one that you can actually control um, it is difficult because we have conflicting policies because in Botswana, farmers actually get paid to plough by hectare from the government. They get money. The more area that they plough, the more money they get. It's a frustrating policy. Um, the individuals have to be actively staying by their field to ensure the safety of the, of the equipment and make sure it's all working. So we have to see a structure, a tent, just some form of actually staying by their field and protecting it. It sounds silly, but the farmer actually has to experience high levels of conflict. Some farmers do love to exaggerate to us, but we are now experienced enough that we can go to a field and have a look around and get a pretty good understanding if these people have got frequent elephant visitors or not. Ideally, we do prioritize those that are located next to the wildlife corridors because we definitely can understand that they have a very genuine problem. As, as you've seen by these corridor videos, we can get up to a thousand elephants passing through. So obviously those people right next to those corridors are of high importance to us. A lot of our farmers are very elderly. I'd say the average, most of our farmers are well over 50 years old. So those with disabilities and that are really elderly are obviously prioritized for us. Um, and it's important that 
we really are, we say, keep doing what you're normally doing. If they're using any traditional mitigation techniques, they must just keep doing that. We don't want them to become inactive when they start using our mitigations. It's all meant to be used together. So it's, this took us a long time to come up with exactly this list, but we have, and we are always fine tuning it, but we are quite strict about it. So here is obviously the solar strobe light was, which was of particular interest. This is what actually started our dialogue as, as we heard in the first place. So I found out about this idea by um, having those conversation with, with the farmers and the farmers were actually saying, we were getting into the nitty gritty of how to use lights in a field to try and scare away elephants. And I consistently kept hearing farmers saying, if you switch the torch on and off, on and off and do a sequence, often the elephants get scared. And I thought that's really interesting. There's something in this. And then I read a paper, uh, um, a study that was done up in Kenya by a young Maasai man, and he was actually using flashing lights to keep lions away from his boma. Um, but I'd never seen it actually used on elephants. Um, so I ran an experiment. Um, this is an example of one of our lights. So it's, it's this little solar panel on the top there. And it's got a day night sensor within it. And it flashes all through the night nonstop. I've had some of these lights for over eight years and they're still flashing lights. So it shows how sustainable they are. They don't take any charging. The farmers put them up when they're growing the crops and then they take them down at the end of the season. We try and do that with all our mitigation programs, all the mitigations that I've outlined, because we want to reduce the chance of the elephants habituating to them. Uh, what is unique is each light is actually a different color. So we set them up at 10 meter intervals along the side that the elephants most commonly will come from. And then at nighttime, it actually looks like a barrier. And then we can change the pattern of the lights, depending on how often you have elephants coming down. So if you have elephants every day, then you change their pattern every single day. So then it actually appears differently to them. I have a little video, we'll see if it works. Yeah, so that's actually what it looks like at night. It's very hard to actually video at nighttime, but it does look very, very disorientating. I'm gonna keep going. Um, yeah, so what, uh, the results of that, and we're still using the lights, the Utes lights are very, very popular. We found that they're only really good on smaller fields, so one to two hectares. The larger fields, uh, they, they do become less effective, I would say. But in the time that I've been running this program, we've only had elephants cross the lights three times, which is pretty good results. Um, I was very, very surprised by the effect of them. What was also really important and key to the program was creating a demonstration site. And we realized it's all well and good about us going out and telling people how great our program is, but we needed another way of endorsing it. So we created a demonstration site with all of our different mitigations with the toolkit. And we let the farmers tell the other farmers about their experiences with it. They can be your best marketing, um, marketing gurus. And I think that is very, very powerful. And now 100% of our recruitment into our program is coming from recommendations from other farmers. So I feel very, very, it's, it's been a long time working at it, but to have farmers selling us and, and sending us, um, sending farmers our way is, is fantastic. And I think the demonstration site was really instrumental in that because they were up all year round. Um, yeah, so I think that was really, really important. It's also set up in town. Um, yeah, so it was very helpful. So overall, the program has been making some really great progress. Um, you can see the number of raids versus preventions, such as for the 2020 to 2022 seasons. Um, so we've had well over 100 preventions. I must say what is difficult is getting the farmers to always report preventions. They obviously always want to talk about raids and negative things, but it's actually really nice to be able to hear preventions, but they often don't want to, they don't report the prevention. So it's like squeezing the information out um, of them to get that information. But we've had a 92% success rate, which is pretty phenomenal. We've, we're completely blown away by it. We have, it's going to be much larger now, but we have over 100 farmers in that weekly program. Um, we've had zero elephants shot by the farmers that are participating in the program, which is just absolutely blows my mind. Very grateful for that. Um, and 
everyone, every well, 97% of the farmers that are in the program have actually increased their crop yield, which is a fabulous result because we love to measure how much uh, success they're having. And we're operating now, and this has also increased 12 villages, but we're actually extending to 15 villages in two different, well, yes, two different districts in the country. Um, and I think it's really important to check and see what the farmers think, so get their opinions on it. So I'm always at the end of each season reviewing what they think, what can we improve, what are we lacking in. I think they're our best reviewers. So when uh, we asked the farmers just the last season, have you seen an increase in yield? Now, as I said, 92% said yes. Um, and do they believe that the LE census is benefiting them? That's also a really important question. 58% strongly agree, 28% agreed. Um, and then we're still working on our smaller proportions than six and seven percent. Well, we had six percent undecided and seven percent who said, no, we don't think it's working, even though they were increasing their yields. But that's their opinion. I respect their opinion. So now we're, we're moving on to what do they do when they have a yield? So um, markets are really tricky for us, actually. Um, Farmers don't have that many options of where to sell. So a lot of it, especially due to COVID, people are just using it for household consumption. Um, it's wonderful because now they actually have a surplus because they've been getting really great yields. So it's a question now, what do you do with the surplus? Do you want to start actually trying to make some money off of this? We now have internal markets uh, within the villages of the farmers exchanging their yield, which is really fabulous. And now we're at a point, and a few months ago, I ran a workshop with all our participating farmers in how to grow vegetables, which was very exciting. Um, so now we're starting to really try to expand it. I strongly believe that Chobe District should be able to feed Chobe District, but unfortunately the majority of the produce that we get in our supermarkets is imported from South Africa. I think it needs to change, and I think the Chobe farmers are starting to really want to make that change now that they're actually feeling like they have some options, which is fantastic. We also introduced a grain crushing initiative. Again, none of our work is really based on money. So we actually asked the farmers, this is one of the many surveys that we did, and we asked them what would be most helpful to you right now. And every, it was amazing how many people were saying, uh, great, we love a grain crusher. So maize is our biggest crop that we harvest. And crushing that maize so you can eat it is a very time consuming job. Um, so we bought a portable grain crusher. So when we're not busy in crop rating season, we're driving our little mobile grain crusher around to the villages and we're crushing grain for free. So farmers can bring their grain in and we crush it. And then putting, it's adding so much more value to the grain itself. I can't tell you what endorsement it does. It helps us recruit more farmers and meet more farmers by offering that service. Um, the majority of grain that we crush is maize, but we also crush sorghum and millet. So they're our basic staples. This was fundamental in COVID. Uh, we had quite intensive lockdowns. Farmers could, didn't have access to any of the supermarkets. So everyone was really living on their grain. The farmers don't have to be in our program for crushing. We let anyone come and crush. As I said, it's a great recruitment initiative. And finally, education and awareness. I don't think you can have a coexistence conflict program without it. It's absolutely key. We do it in so many different avenues. Um, again, we're, we're actually a very, very small team. So it's still myself and, and our team that goes out and, and does that. Um, we're always adapting it to different audiences, but our big focus is safety. Um, interestingly, in Kasani and Kazangula, over 50% of the residents there did not grow up in wildlife areas. They've all moved into the area for tourism jobs, but they have got no idea what to do when they're walking home and they see an elephant. No idea when they're coming back from the pub after having probably way too many beers and they see an elephant. No idea when their taxi driver is hooting and racing into elephants, they don't know that that's wrong. So a lot of our education is just about basic safety and basic elephant ecology. Unfortunately, very little wildlife information uh, is in the curriculum in Botswana. It's very sad. There's a big focus on agricultural animals, but very little information on, on wildlife. Um, so a lot of our program is around myth busting and, and just actually having a chat to people about elephants. And then that's great because it often leads to us chatting about buffalo and all these other animals. So that's been really, really powerful. We also have created a lot of different education tools. 
So there's a, in the middle there, that's a safety poster that I created that, that came out of my PhD actually. And it was just what you do when you're driving and there's an elephant, what you do when you're walking and there's an elephant and what do you do when you're in your house and you have an elephant in your garden that won't leave. Um, that had huge impacts. We also asked where people got their information from. They said tuck shops, which is little corner shops that everybody has on their, in their neighborhoods and taxis. So we put these posters up in, a, in as many taxis as we could and as, in a, as many tuck shops as we could. Uh, that's us doing some of the safety talks. Um, and we also have created a whole line of children's books. That's one of our co-founders, um, co Kelly Landon's Absolute Passion. We've collaborated with an American publisher and we have made a number of different children's books. We've put them in English and Setswana and we're trying to distribute them in as many schools as possible always with key conservation messages. Um, fires are a big issue, so we have Malello and the fire, and we have the same characters throughout. The characters are actually based on the elephants and the orphanage that we used to run, so it makes it very real. Um, we also have uh, created a learning about elephants book. Again, we're using really fun cartoons. It's based on the safety talks we had, but we've just adapted it into a children's book. And uh, they've been really, really, really successful. We just want to keep going with that. But yeah, that's sort of the threefold approach. Um, hopefully, we all got something out of that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. And yeah, I very much want to bring on some questions. But thank you. Just before the question, I would like to give a quick brief of our LRS and what we are doing so that the audience out here also knows what WNPS is doing. So we have been um, uh, experimenting this uh, light ripple system, as we call it, LRS, in, um, in Sri Lanka. We started about two and a half years back. Uh, our human elephant conflict uh, subcommittee, headed by Dave now, uh, and Danushka, there are two of them here today. Uh, it was created by an army brigadier uh, who tried it out uh, in his in the uh, army camps in the, uh, in a few locations in Sri Lanka, and he thought it was successful. So today we have 21 locations in about five districts. We're working with farmers. Our experiences have been that we can't work with a community of farmers. Uh, Sri Lankans or humans fight with each other, and it all goes pear shaped from there. But uh, what has worked with has been with individual farmers and older farmers that have really maintained the system. And uh, with the research we have today, we have done, a, uh, we feel that it's about an 80% efficacy. Uh, quite differently to what uh, Tempe is trying, our lights are all LED lights in white color and they blink uh, cons consistently. They're put on at 6 p.m., uh, taken out at 6 a.m. Uh, but we are looking to do a system that will be censored, uh, that will understand that there is a big animal in front and then the light comes on so that the elephants don't get used to it. We had some funny stories where one, in one location the elephant came on the reverse. One location uh, it had taken <laughs> teak leaves and hidden its eyes and tried to come in. This is what the farmers are telling us. So um, it's a mitigated method. We are hoping that we can do a scientific document and hand over to the government to say this is an option it's a little cheaper but it's not a foolproof system so that's what the lrs is doing and that's what wnps is doing so just wanted to give you a background because it was very influential in why tempe is here today uh, because that's how they kind of research and found uh, uh, who tempe adams was so uh, just wanted we felt that we the audience should know what uh, we are also trying. Uh, can I go with the first question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you have the mic, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's an important question for everyone here. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, we um, 
uh, Sri Lanka is very unaware of exactly how many elephants we have, mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of uh, stories about trying to do the Big Black Water Wildlife. We have uh, Mr. Ranjan Marasinghe here, uh, that they are trying to do a survey. Mm -hmm. And I believe the last survey was done in 2012. And um, indication was that survey was done where uh, people were put in the driest time of the year, it, uh, somewhere in August. Uh, and and uh, oh sorry sorry and uh, it was uh, they were doing a water count uh, elevators coming to the water count and what what was done was say for example at 10 p.m. so 10 to 10 10 o'clock to 10 10 every 10 minutes they counted the elephants and then 10 10 to 10 20 like that and they have taken a count where we claim to have about 5,800. And what this count is telling us is, it's the minimum number of elephants we could have in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something that some of the South Africa, some of the African countries have done before, or is it something that you feel is a good option? Independent, because we have forest elephants, or as you compare yeah. it to your forest elephants and not the savannas. So yeah, yeah. no, absolutely, um, it's a great question. Um, it is. I, I think it does give you an estimate, your, ba your most basic minimum estimate. Um, and I think what is really challenging with surveys, I think, obviously, I think it's more related to how you, obviously, savannah elephants, they're easy to count from the air. Because we don't have jungle, we don't have big tall trees. So we do aerial surveys, um, which are always critiqued and criticized, but it is the most accurate way that we count um, savannah elephants. Um, but I understand Sri Lankan elephants and forest elephants are more relatable. So forest elephants that are found in West and Central Africa. Um, and I think it's, it's an area that people are putting a lot of funding towards, especially within the forest elephant sphere and how to produce accurate counts. And I think that's somewhere where we can collaborate and share information on. Because I'm always, I'm in the African elephant specialist group and I'm always wondering why we're not speaking to those in the Asian elephant specialist group a little bit more often because I think we have a lot of shared solutions. There needs to be more collaboration. So I'm very much pushing for that. Um, but there has been a lot of different studies recently done really fine tuning how to count the forest elephants. They, they are presenting a preliminary report for the forest elephants at CITES right now, the population counts. So that's where I would very happily try and, and get their fine tuned reports of how they've been running their surveys and, and share that sort of information. I have heard about the waterhole counts. I know they're, they're uh, common in Zimbabwe. Uh, I, I think that is what they used to do in Botswana many, many number of years ago. Botswana's scale is quite different as I was talking about with the water and the land use areas, but I know it's been used in South Africa as well. Um, but that's more small um, private reserves um, and things like that. But I think, you know, technology is evolving and I think there's definitely a, a place where we, you may as well learn from the lessons in other countries uh, that are working in similar sort of habitat styles. So uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of promise to um, definitely do surveys, but maybe fine tune them. I understand cost is an issue as well, though. So there's layers to it, but it's out there. The information is definitely out there. Okay. Maybe you have a question out there. Thank, thanks for the talk. My name is uh, Alexander Brechkovsky. So I, I'm sorry if I missed this from your slides, but um, there's sort of two things. So the, there's 130,000 African elephants in Botswana. That seems to be the most recent count, healthiest population in Africa. There's 2.6 million people, one of the lowest human populations in Africa. And I saw some stats on elephant deaths in your area, but I, I'm just sort of trying to understand with those two pieces of information, sort of is your project aimed at reducing human death or are you trying to increase crops and crop yield? It just sounds, you know, with such a healthy human population, sorry, with such a healthy elephant population, like is this conflict even have a impact on the population in your area? That's my question. Great question. Uh, so the figure was human deaths, not elephant deaths. Unfortunately, elephant deaths are very hard to get any information on. Elephants are definitely injured through conflict. There are definitely elephants killed through conflict, but it's very hard to actually get real numbers on it. Um, and I think, yes, we definitely do have conflict. Conflicts relative to the individual that's living on the front line of it. Um, so basically, our measure is 
we were at the point where farmers were completely giving up on farming because of the elephants that were moving through the area, right? Um, and it's a very strong tradition. There's a lot of tradition associated with it. There's a lot of pride in farming. And we were getting, yeah, people were incredibly frustrated uh, because of a lot of different reasons, the failures in the past in the area at the time, um, but conflict rates are increasing. So solutions were needing to be found. Our measure of success is if we have the farmers in our program, that's what I'm able to get data from. The fact I said that we haven't had any elephants shot since the pro being in the program by those farmers and they're on the front lines, I feel like that's a really great measure of success. If we can also increase their yield and allow them to come home and actually eat something that they've grown themselves and feed their family with their yield, then that is a wonderful success. If we're now at a point where we can start to reduce the imports that we have coming into the country and Botswana can start feeding themselves, that's a great success. So that's kind of what we're growing on. That's what we're trying to expand on. Uh, and that's how we sort of are measuring it. And we're now at a point where farmers are more complaining to me about other species now and not elephants. So I feel like elephants was the number one thing that, and now we're going to baboons. What do I do to get rid of baboons in my field? Uh, that is also a very tricky problem, um, but I feel like it's great that we've now, they're feeling like there's some solutions uh, and you don't have to turn to a gun. Um, so I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for the informative talk. Uh, recently, I applied for a USAID concept paper where I wanted to change the order chemistry of water holes in Sri Lanka. Okay. So what I was trying to say is like, you know, poets in Sri Lanka call uh, the rain, the smell of rain or the smell of rain on earth. It's called Petrico, P-E-T-R-I-C-H-O-R. And that is uh, a certain volatile compound secreted by actinobacteria, like, you know, the, the fungus-like bacteria and cyanobacteria. And Sri Lanka has had, uh, it's called blood drain where there are trichodesmium and things like, uh, like cyanob cyanobacteria infuse rainwater that fall. So when I looked at your slides, you showed that with the rainfall, mm -hmm. there is a conglomeration of elephants or they are kind of reacting to the rainfall soon afterwards, okay? So my question is, I'm a microbiologist. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do was change the order chemistry of water holes near civilization, near the households to break down this petrico, to break down the geosmin. Geosmin is the chemical compound, it has two benzene rings and it's a fairly aromatic uh, uh, volatile compound. So the thing is, if we break down the geosmin near civilization, mm -hmm. to prevent elephants sniffing it and coming towards it, but leaving it as it is in the, in the forest areas or water holes in the forest areas. So my, my idea was, but it didn't get, uh, it didn't pass the initial stage. There were 140 mm -hmm. applications for that. Uh, so the thing is, I'm just wondering, can we change water holes and not change the elephant? Change the water holes by, uh, by breaking, like taking the volatile compounds out near civilization and leaving it there so that they won't encroach on the actual uh, civilization, but they will go towards the forest areas. And one tiny question, uh, how is, I, I hear that there is a strong sense of democracy in Botswana. Has that helped in preserving the elephant populations? Two big questions. Um, elephants are really fussy about what water they drink. That much I would say. They very much have their favorite places to be drinking and they definitely change throughout the year. Um, if your water is too saline, they definitely won't drink it. A lot of animals won't drink it. Um, but elephants, if you see an artificial water hole pumping, you'll see an elephant will put its trunk exactly where that fresh, fresh water is coming out. So they're incredibly, they know where that water is coming from and that's, they're very fussy. Um, I, unfortunately, I have seen the case where they have sunk water, artificial water holes in certain areas to try and get elephants to move to those areas. 
but they haven't liked the taste of the water, so they haven't been using them, and that was a big waste of funding. So I think it's something where you have to really understand what kind of water they like in the first place to start implementing that, and really understanding the properties that's in that water would be my recommendation. Again, yes, trialing this idea before implementing it, but there could be value in it. I think you've got to be very careful about where you move water to. Um, we've seen the cases where you've tr they've tried to sink artificial water holes to take elephants away from the urban and agricultural areas, and actually it's just pushed conflict to those new areas, um, especially because livestock is often taken to drink there, um, and that creates a whole other level of conflict. Um, so I think it's it has potential. I think everything has potential. I think it's great to think outside the box because we have to. But I do think you'd need to really trial it and a lot of thought would be need to be put in as to where you would put those um, places. It's very topical in Botswana right now. Everyone wants to be sinking artificial water holes everywhere. And it makes me so nervous <laughs> because it feels like a big waste of funding and I don't want funding to be wasted. Um, but I do think there's hope for it, but I think they need, and the maintenance of a water hole is huge as well. A lot of what we do is just maintain the national park water holes in the country. Every dry season, we write to the Department of Wildlife and said, please let us fix your water holes um, so that all the wildlife can drink in the dry season. Otherwise that puts more pressure, um, it condenses the issue. Uh, so it's it could potentially work, but there'd be a, a lot of thought and planning needs to be in that. Yeah, I think the step one would be to just work out exactly what properties elephants love to drink. I think that would be the best, best, yeah, um, step in the right direction. And democracy impacting conservation, potentially, you know, I mean, Botswana has only had, it's only been independent since the sixties. There's been a very small number of actual presidents coming through. Um, but I think the original presidents, yes, I think they set up that foundation of conservation uh, and the fact that so much of the land was allocated to wildlife protected areas um yeah i think it was i think that that was instrumental the heritage that those first few leaders really set up but it is a democracy we have elections next year okay we have we'll have two more questions one over here from Kumudini. Uh, but i would like to ask you is you know you said that conducting a survey of how many elephants a country has is good but a very specific question why would sri lanka want to do a survey of elephants why would sri lanka want to do a survey of elephants if we do find i don't know whether that survey actually worked or we counted the same elephant five times right but if we do a proper survey and we do find that we have more elephants than we need what do we do? Do we cull them or do we catch them from the wild and give jokers to keep them in uh, as domestic animals? This, are, of course, I would like to ask the DWC, but I would like your opinion on this. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's more a question if what do you do if you have too many elephants, but who decides on what's too many elephants? Um, that's a this idea of too many elephants is obviously very much thrown around in Botswana. Um, and this whole concept of carrying capacity is also really controversial and how does one calculate carrying capacity and who does say there's too many elephants, but I, I do think uh, surveys can be very difficult, um, especially when technology is improving and the way we can count is improving because numbers do change, I think we've actually seen an increase in tigers now. And is that because we have more tigers or is that because our survey methods have improved. So it, that's the exact same question that applies here. Um, but I think it's, I personally feel it's always important to know what you have, because that's how you have to learn to manage it. I don't think, I think we get a bit too obsessed about numbers of animals, to be totally honest. I think sometimes, I think it's similar to climate change. Why are we still debating if it's happening or not? Regardless, something is happening and we need to be mitigating and managing it, right? So regardless here, people do have conflict with elephants. So I think the focus should be on how to mitigate it. Um, yeah, I hope that helps answer it. Oh. Hello, uh, excuse me, 
I just wanted to ask you two questions. They are not very scientific, but uh, I, I have been a researcher and ecologist in my young days in, in Sweden. Uh, but let me ask you a question. What made you come to Sri Lanka to do this elephant thing? Have you, there is a very famous Sri Lankan, a cousin of mine, who went to school with the president of Botswana and they are two friends. So the president, when he became president, he invited this man, he's called Utum Korea. Have you heard of him? I have not, I'm no. so sorry, I haven't. Now, Utum Korea, he became the chief of police, the IGP of Botswana. Wow. And he's still living in Botswana. Wow. He's, he's the most famous Sri Lankan in Botswana. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to say this because it's interesting as far as Sri Lanka and Botswana relations are concerned. Yeah. Now he, is, and he is very interested in elephants. And what is strange is, this is a thing which you may not know, that when, he, this is about 25 years ago, he has been in Botswana for 50 years. He's about 75 years of age, but he still, uh, he works still. And he originally brought in from Sri Lanka 12 mahouts. And he asked the president to let him have a whole group of elephants. And he got these mahouts to train the African elephants in the similar manner as they trained Sri Lankan elephants. And they found that the African elephant was just as good to be as far as training is concerned and could do all the things the Sri Lankan elephant used to do. I mean, this may be a question of, you know, people don't like now to say, you know, to treat elephants badly and all, but this, he did this. And in Botswana, they had, and it was the first time in Africa that uh, they got trained elephants where tourists could go off their backs at that time and, and, and watch the wildlife. Wow. It's very interesting. I, I was aware of it, actually. I did know about that program. Um, I was, so the first person is, why, why am I here? Um, I was invited by the society. It's, we've been having a dialogue for a number of years now uh, about the light, specifically the light program and sharing that information. Um, so I think that was the main um, crux of why I, I came on over here. Um, and I was aware of that program, actually. Um, my the uh, founder or the director of Elephants Without Borders was actually put in charge of the elephant herd that was established there to help manage to their release. Um, so yes, I definitely know exactly what you're talking about. And I remember thinking at the time, what an interesting connection that we have. Uh, th this was a training from Sri Lanka, actually. Um, but there are a lot of similarities between the two countries. The more I have conversations with people, the more it's, it's incredible um, how much information we can share. And, and yeah, I think it's a really positive thing. But thank you, yeah. One more from that side and then. Uh, just two questions. The first one for is for you, doctor. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one is, we have seen there's an initiative taken in Sri Lanka where we're gonna fence the villages with a water canal, canal of water. Uh, to mitigate these elephant attacks or the conflicts, yeah. So, what is the practical? Yeah, what's your perspective on it? Like, uh, was it practical and has been tried it somewhere else? That is one. And the second one is for for the society and all. Is there any model village that uh, all these, uh, like even uh, the, the traps or maybe the lights, even uh, fencing with electric uh, fences? So is there any model village where all these things are tested and uh, with this agricultural harmony and all, where we can also channel and have, have a look into it? So we have, once we have a model village with the proven concept, we can actually replicate in some other areas. So uh, is there any village kind of like... Yeah, there is model villages that have the village fencing concept and the agricultural fencing concept that uh, CCR, uh, Center for Conservation and Research, uh, Dr. Prutu Fernando's idea. Uh, I know uh, the DWC told me, told us uh, that uh, the National Elephant Policy Plan has been now revitalized again, and they are going to test a model 
in the Anuradhapura and Purunagala districts as well uh, as as the um, uh, elephant village fencing option is in the elephant policy plan. So, but there are current model villages that are, well, we, I can't really call them model villages, but there are villages that are having the elephant fencing and there are areas and locations that we have the light ripple system that we are trying as well. So you could take, take it offline and ask me where and I can tell sure, you where sure, to go to. Sure. Yeah. So about the water canals? Uh, and the fencing, yeah, that's a great question. And we've been having a lot of dialogues um, about it. I don't think fences are bad controversial topic um, but I think they can go wrong very easily I think you can easily set up a good successful electric fence program but a lot of thought and planning needs to be going into it and unfortunately I think that's often not the case um, I think we have had many different cluster fencing programs in Botswana so fencing off a specific area and asking the farmers to then farm there and, and put a lot of protection and effort into that. Some people think it's a marvelous idea. I think, again, that could be potentially a really great idea, but planning and thought needs to be put in. Um, we've had two pretty big failures of, of cluster fencing where millions of dollars were put into it. And again, I think the, those fences were down within a month which was really frustrating to see because, again, you know, it's just a waste of conservation funding and they could have been avoided. Uh, if there had been more planning put into it. So more knowledge of actually how wildlife are using and moving through that area that, that wasn't necessarily considered, um, how to actually construct the fence. So they got construction people from non-wildlife areas coming and building those fences. Um, so they, they weren't the most robust fences. And the, the most important thing was the farmers themselves didn't really know what was going on. They didn't know who was responsible for the maintenance of the fence. They didn't know who their neighbors were that they were farming with. And so when I asked everyone who's responsible or involved in the fence maintenance, everyone pointed at each other. And I said, well, yeah, so that's unfortunately where, where it did go wrong. So I think maintenance of electric fences is also really big, um, but it's not to say they don't work. I think they, do, they are the, the solution in a lot of situations, unfortunately, but I do think we need to be a little bit wiser and a lot more thoughtful and do a lot more consideration as to how you can adapt that fencing program to that specific wildlife that you have in the area and the community in that area. And now uh, you could spend 10 minutes while she's having a cup of tea to ask anything that you missed or could ask. Uh, there was a question about where your publications are published. Uh, we get that from you and put it on our website and whatnot. I can say it right now, it's on okay. our website. Okay. Elephant Star Borders, we put all our publications, all our reports, everything in the media goes straight on our website. Thank you, Tempty. Great stuff. And if you don't mind, just coming in front of the podium here. And uh, let me first invite our past president, Spencer, yeah, that's the firing squad coming after you to give the usual traditional gift back to all our speakers. And uh, thank you for coming. And I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Spencer. Great, thank you. And we have, um, you know, there are three parties, uh, Jetwing, Dilma, and NTB, who are co-partners in uh, helping us bring Tempe down. And we really appreciate their contributions as well. And um, we'd also like to invite uh, Teja and Ramanika Unambu. Two of them are going to hand over two of the publications that NTB has been doing uh, to Tempe. Uh, just that's your homework to read. Yes, lovely publications They're funded by them. So. One more, Ramanika. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll, that will bring curtains down on the event today. Thank you very much for the active participation and for being here despite all these constraints today. So Tempe is around. Uh, we've been working her hard. 
but you can grab her for a short question or two. Keep your questions tight so that more people can throw questions at her during shorter durations. And uh, thank you once again, everyone, and look forward to seeing you next month and beyond. Good night.